So, so good afternoon. Um, just, just a little bit briefly uh, to begin with, the historical description and, and when dystonia first featured in the literature, it was actually in the 16th century that um, physician and um, author Rabli um, introduced this term torticoli and it was in the 18th century in 1888 that Charcot who's the godfather of modern neurology described a patient at a Tuesday lesson in the Salpatriere of a woman who had an eight month history of painful spasms affecting her sternocleidomastoid and trapezius. In 1911 Oppenheim uh, coined the term dystonia that we use today more recently, a group of neurologists, specifically movement disorder specialists, came together in 2013 where they defined, redefined dystonia and reclassified it so that um, neurologists and physicians around the world could better understand and also treat and diagnose it. And so they came up with this description of dystonia and said that dystonia is a movement disorder um, that results in abnormal, intermittent and sustained postures um, that can be twisting and that they're often worsened by voluntary activity. So as mentioned by Juiced earlier, there are a number of postures um, that you may assume when you're affected with cervical dystonia. The, the first one that we see here on the top left is torticollis and there is twisting and turning of the head to, to the side in the horizontal plane. Lateral collis, there's a tilt of the head where the ear goes to the shoulder and retro collis where there's a pulling back of the head. And anterior collis, there's forward flexion of the head and neck. So there are many muscles involved and, and muscles targeted in botulinum toxin injections and two of the main ones um, that are involved are the splenus capitis at the back of the head and neck and then the sternocleidomastoid muscle at the front of the neck. So Dr. Edwards spoke about this a little earlier and he mentioned um, geste antagoniste and this is some people find when they touch their face lightly or they they rub the back of their head against something, that they can get temporary relief from these abnormal postures um, that affect them in cervical dystonia. Um, sometimes it's actually sufficient to think about doing that. So thinking about touching your face or um, touching the back of your head can improve your postures um, temporarily. And more recently, Frucht and colleagues described um, this closing the loop of the geste antagoniste where if you get someone else's hand and direct it to your face that that can relieve your symptoms. And from the studies it, it, it's recognised that up to 60% of people um, have this relieving factor and it's thought that it interrupts this network that Dr Edwards was speaking about where the motor and sensory systems come together. So, so who is affected, and Laura is going to speak about this a little bit later um, in her epidemiology paper in Ireland. Um, and before this, um, Professor Hutchinson, Dr. Reardon and Dr. Beiser did a literature search of all the published cohorts of um, dystonia that, ha that have been published. And so we can see from this graph, the vertical graph um, demonstrates the number of men as compared with women that are affected. As we go up the graph to the top, it means that more men are affected. And along um, the horizontal plane, it's age in years. And as you progress along the horizontal um, line, you get older. So we can see here in green, and the green balls represent people of who are affected by cervical dystonia. So it sits midway in the age and years and midway of the proportion of men affected. So what this means in essence is that it typically um, affects people in their 40s and that women, although men are affected, women are more affected by this condition, um, one and a half to two times as, as much as their male counterparts. So, so does it run in families? Well, we, we know from the literature that up to 25% of people who have cervical dystonia do have an affected family member. There have more recently, um, there have been three recent gene discoveries for cervical dystonia, but these represent only a minority um, of cases. And so if we don't have genes, and, and how can we then increase our understanding of this condition? Well, as Dr. Edwards very eloquently put earlier, it's a, it's a culmination of many things. And so 
increasing our understanding of the genetics, but also there's probably an interplay from neurotransmitters and brain networks. Um, and, and, and together, these, these areas are brought together by our ongoing um, work that we're doing, as with other centres are doing in the field of research. So do we understand the cause? Well, we're, we're endeavouring through the, the work we do with the research department to, to better understand what, what may cause um, cervical dystonia. Rebecca mentioned earlier um, the temporal discrimination threshold, which many of you today will have already participated in and understand what that test is. And so what we've seen um, in our studies is that particularly for cervical dystonia, that, that most, the majority of the patients ha are affected ha with an abnormal temporal discrimination threshold, and that 50% of their unaffected relatives, that is relatives who don't have cervical dystonia, also have an abnormal temporal discrimination threshold. And the TDT, we believe, is an ability to detect environmental change. That is, when something happens in the environment that we don't anticipate or expect, like a car coming across the road. So how do we detect this change? Rebecca mentioned earlier the superior colliculus, and this is this small structure that's highlighted in red, this is the whole brain, and then if we go in closer, we can see it at the back. Colliculi comes from the Latin word meaning hillock, and you can see it's like two bumpers at the back of the brain there. And this tiny little highly laminated structure feeds into um, the visual pathways, but equally it feeds into the networks that, that control head and neck muscle. And so we wonder, is there an abnormality at the level of this superior colliculus, but equally the neurotransmitters that feed into the superior colliculus that might in part explain um, what brain network causes cervical dystonia. So how, how can we look at the superior colliculus? Well, this is a study that I, I'm involved with, with Professor Hutchinson, and we're doing an MRI study to try and look at that area. So we take an MRI scan, and during the scan, we run an experiment. So you can see on the right of the MRI scan, there is a, um, it'll come in a moment, there's a sphere and a ball that's coming towards the screen. And this is, this is a, loom, a looming object, and it's, it's like this, abner this sort of ability to te detect environmental change. It's like the car coming um, along the road. And so during the MRI scan, people look at videos of looming balls and balls that move away from them, and then balls that just randomly appear. But particularly the looming balls, we know that to, be, to activate the superior colliculus. And so from presenting these paradigms to our participants, we can look closely then at the superior colliculus and understand what's happening at superior collicular level, what blood flow is there, and are there any abnormalities that exist? So this is a study that I'm doing, and, and in fact, many of you have agreed and your relatives have agreed to participate. So I'd just like to say at this point, thank you so much um, for your support, not only in this study, but in all the work that we've been doing, because really, without, without your help, it's simply not possible. So thank you so much.